Good evening. It's December 1st, 2013. I'm Thomas Sheridan, and you're listening to The Velocity of Now, the radio station, radio show, actually, on the Type 1 radio network, and a radio show where absolutely anything can happen over the next two hours. And I probably will tonight because I had nothing scripted. So tonight I'll be winging the show. I have a few notes jotted down, but I haven't haven't been I've been occupied, should we say, this weekend, and haven't had a a lot of time to do any stories. But there's still things drifting through my consciousness and through the electromagnetic spectrum, and a sort of a a subject I've been looking at there for a while through art, and we'll talk about this in the second hour. It's, basically American mysticism. You often hear about America in terms of being a cold, hard place, but, you know, in terms of its, its, its identity and its, uh, its understanding of itself. But it's actually, it's, believe it or not, it's actually a form of American mysticism, and it shows mainly through arts and philosophy. And the second hour, I'll be talking about that. Again, my name is Thomas Sheridan. The website is www.thomassheridanarts.com. Uh, there's loads of articles there. I've got some very good stuff I got this week. Uh, somebody, a friend of mine in, in Ireland who's a school teacher, leaked to me letters that were sent to the principal that was that the, the, this person had saw, seen on the principal's desk, took photographs of them, and they were common purpose uh, NLP bullshit training, brainwashing crap. And I've got them on the blog. If you have a look at that, it's quite interesting to see how they've actually moved common purpose now into Irish education. And the whole purpose now is to do the same thing they've done in the UK. What they want to do is basically find the robots and the psychopaths of the future. That's all they're interested in. They're not interested in finding kids who are dynamic, creative, intuitive, caring. They're looking for robots who will follow orders and just do as they're told. That's really what they want. And if you look at the how what this document has laid out, that's precisely how you see it. It's just uh, it's just looking for robots. One thing I never noticed before about the Common Purpose logo, it looks like a bullet hole. It looks like a bullet hole through a glass window, which is a very interesting thing when you think about it because they're, the, the sort of socialist Marxist communitarianism of Common Purpose is not done through the bullet in the head. It's done through the bullet through the consciousness. And that's how they eliminate anyone who's free thinking, anyone who can have a bit of dynamic creativity, think outside the box intuition, they are removed. That's thomasheridanarts.com. I will post this link at some point. I've been not able to update the pages lately. In the bottom, the website again, thomasheridanarts.com. If you can support and help me there any way you can. I've got a beautiful calendar that everyone seems to love. That's a... That's not going to do for much longer. So if you got your eye on my calendar, my artwork of 2014, you have to move soon on that. And uh, I hope you enjoy reading through my site, looking through it, and getting all the useful information in there. Now, it's been an interesting week. Uh, I want to talk a little bit first about the Nigella Lawson and the Charles Hatchie thing. It's got a bit, It's got a bit weird and a bit strange. Now, the only way he was ever, ever going to get over the images of him basically strangling her in a restaurant was if he could deliver a bombshell. Now, the bombshell would have to be something incredibly damning about her. It might be true now. I'm not taking sides in this thing now. I don't particularly like him. But at the same time, too, we're not privy to what went on behind closed doors. So I knew he was either going to go haywire and throw the bomb in. You see, this is what they're like. They, they, when, when the shit is against the wall and the things are not working out for them, they, they will go full on character assassinating. Just think of a rat back in a, backed into a corner. This is why I always tell people to never ever challenge these types, because what happens is they, uh, they have no decency. They will not stop. They will, they, they will, they will tell incredible lies about you. It's been done to me on a forum that I was on. I left the forum because I found that it was infiltrated with, by a cult and a private detective who'd look at, who was a member of the forum just casually had told me that one of the forum members, the moderator, was actually a member of the cult and the whole thing was probably a spy and a trap to get me. So I left and I knew it was right away. I didn't expect what was going to happen, but the, the, what basically what they did, the two, two lunatics on that group told liars, possibly because they were probably afraid that they were going to be, uh, you know, 
I don't know, attacked by the cult that come after me. And also one guy on there had absolutely tried everything. It was incredibly vicious and psychotic, but that's what he is to uh, when he's not waving a teddy bear around and sitting in a bubble bath. And he did this to uh, to basically make destroy me completely so I could not move off anywhere else, get out of my life, and then invited the cult neighbors onto the forum to, uh, well, you know, what cult members do when they're in it, when they're around vulnerable people. So anyway, that happened to me. So I knew if this guy, uh, Sachi, was the same, he was going to try that also. And uh, what seems to have happened now is he has a uh, – he's accused her of very, very bad things and it's kind of ruined her image. Remember, Nigella to all of us was the domestic goddess. We all, I, I found her very likable. I don't really care about celebrities one way or another. But I have to say, when I'd seen her interviewed on TV and stuff, she just came across a lot more human – than many other celebrities that you'd find out there. There was a, there was a genuine sort of decency there. And, you know, her, 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 her programs are kind of silly, you know, and that kind of thing. They, you know, they were just what they called them, gastro porn or whatever. She, you know, she was, you know, stupid things like licking cream off cherries and stuff like that and the strawberries. And it was all done, titillation thing for everyone. And it was very clever how it was done. And it got very boring, very quick. But I never had a problem with her personally, even though she comes from a wealthy family. We don't, we don't damn people because of the families they come from. We uh, we judge them on their own personality and their own big character. And she seemed pretty okay to me. And then, you know, the whole thing comes out that he was a picture of what he was looking like. He was strangling her and said, I said to myself, okay, the only way he's going to get out of this is to go for broke. Either take something that's true, that should be kind of sacred and... Uh, and, you know, held back and throw it out there. So I was thinking he was going to say something about her sex life, say she was horrible and bad, say that she was frigid. Oh, you know, kind of destroy the kind of erotic mysticism that exists around Nigella Lawson's image. But I honestly didn't expect he was going to come out and say she was a cocaine fiend. I didn't expect that. Uh, that that came completely out of left field. She doesn't look like a cokehead, but who knows? She's, she seems in quite good shape to me. But then again, you know, even if she took cocaine, I mean, that's 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 her own business in many ways. I, I'm totally I'm totally like a libertarian liberal in that way. If people want to inject themselves with, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, Coca-Cola, that's their own business. Uh, once they're not affecting anyone else, they're robbing another person to get their the, the support they're fixed. I'm not particularly bothered by it. I think all like illegal drugs should be made legal, and I think that would take a lot of the mysticism out of it, and people would be so drawn to it in that kind of titillation way. But anyway, he's pulled this thing out of the bag. Said she's like she's she's she goes mad spending money. Well, she's got the money, so so what? Uh, so he's basically destroyed her career in one fell swoop. It was probably the worst thing he could do. But then I said to myself because it was done to me, but they one that did it to me. Uh, he turned around and said, but I still feel so strongly about it. I still love her. I still care about her. And that's what they do. That's what they do. They, they stab you in the back. They try to destroy it. And then they say, what has happened to my dear friend? Oh, what has happened to them? They've changed. And all the time, the little scumbags are like sitting there thinking they pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. And they have for a while. But uh, you know what they always say, the, the smelliest towards always float to the top of the toilet bowl. So that was the Nigella thing. And uh, I also have an admission to make. I, I lied to people, actually. I, I, had a, I just remembered something that I said, and I, I, I didn't tell you the truth. I said I would never, ever go on the BBC, and I've never been on the BBC. But I just remember it. I fucking well have been on the BBC. And, uh, but it was, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a joke. About, about nine years ago, I'd been out on my, with some friends, and uh, we got back here, and... Uh, one of my mates is from Northern Ireland, and he had a, a Northern Ireland mobile phone with him, a UK mobile phone. And there was some program on BBC that morning, and it was a call-in thing where you could call in and, and you know, yeah, what you call it, uh, call in and, you know, voice concerns. And at the time, uh, I was still pretty, what well, should we say, I was still in a festive spirit from all my, uh, you know, debauchery. With you know, and I think I was you know, so the number came up, and but I was also kind of pissed off too because uh, it was around the time they were trying to use the terms sex up 
the weapons of mass destruction dossier in order to like justify the actions and the invasion of uh, Iran and Iraq. Uh, sorry, Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was all at Blair time. And it was really around the time I was disgusted at that. You know, I could see quite clearly that Blair was a psychopath and that government that he had were filled with psychopaths. And I knew they were trying to use the whole 9 11 thing to get into a war to grab the resources there. And it was around the time Dr. Kelly also vanished. So my friend, because it was at my, it was, I don't know what the pro, I can't remember the program was on BBC Northern Ireland or BBC, you know, the whole network feeding through BBC Northern Ireland. But my mate, uh, my mate from Derry had a, a, a Northern Ireland mobile, so a phone. And so uh, I, 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 caught, I, well, the first mistake was they shouldn't have let me on the air because I think I was, I was blasting like a, uh, something like really hardcore uh, death metal. I think it was Wise Blood. Yeah, it was like Prime Gonzola by Wise Blood. And that, they, they let me on the air with that blasting in the background at like, you know, 10 in the morning. So that was their first hint. And they, they must have been desperate for calls. So I just said I wanted to talk about... Uh, the, the program was about uh, what, how, are you, how are you dealing with the, the, the new world under the terrorists? You know, the whole thing was fear-based. The terrorists have changed our lives. Our lives will never be the same again. The terrorists will never be the same again. So I said to my friend, like, give me the phone call, but I'll have a bit of a laugh at this, this bunch. And so I actually, in no time, I got on the air. And uh, the researcher said, can you turn down the music? And that, that was a big mistake. Because obviously, who plays that kind of music at 10 o'clock in the morning? And I was, I was obviously been out all night on a Saturday. So she told me just to turn it down. I was waiting online, and immediately I went online. The host goes, and we, we had a caller, a caller calling in from, you know, Northern Ireland. Do you have has a comment about, you know, and the guy comes to me and says, how do you feel about life on the terrorism? And I said something like, well, I'm keeping a Fez and a copy of the plan under the kitchen sink in case Bin Laden wins. And there was just like, they had this hard-nosed panel, and their faces just went blank. And my friends all burst out laughing, in the, like, and you could hear them on the mobile and also coming out on the TV. And uh, if you want to see, you want to see four or five faces, like, literally go green on a Sunday morning. It was absolutely hilarious. So I know it was a very bad thing to do, but I was just so pissed off and annoyed at the whole thing. And I kind of like I had to kind of troll this live show. So I want to make an apology for that. I guess I have been on the BBC once and I, I took the piss out of them and I promise I'll never do it again. Now, uh, if you want to do that to me, you can call into the show tonight because uh, I'm, it's, a, it's going to be like an open format show tonight and you can call me in. The number, if you're calling from the United States and Canada, is 347-996-5515. 347-996-5515. If you want to call in, talk about a subject, tell me to go and shite, tell me how you like the show, tell me whatever you want. I welcome anyone and anyone else in the world. You can go to the blog talk page and you can click that little S icon at the top and it will put you through to Steve, who's uh, at, you know, type one mission control tonight. And that will put you through live on the air. So don't be, uh, don't be shy about calling in. And you can, you can abuse me within, uh, within reason. I'm pretty easy going about that stuff. Now, uh, I just got a message here. Apparently, Nigella is going on Oprah to fight back. So, you know, it, it's going into a circus. Now, she'll never recover from this, ever. Never. He'll always have his money. Her public relations, a relation, you know, image is dead. Which, uh, unless she does something really incredible, like makes a porn movie or something like that, I think that's probably where she would get back. But it's interesting how it's interesting how perceptions that way are altered. You know, you you see a person on a TV, and an image is presented of them, and if they're if they're actually a kind of a plausible person. You can read it two ways. You can see that that that's a, a manifestation of the worst aspects of their behavior, or you can see that's a manifestation of the best aspects of their behavior. And I was just thinking about this this week. You know, I was talking about the 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 Jimmy Savile thing, and just to show what absolute scumbags the BBC are and the people within there, except for the ones who've like tried to do something about it or lost their jobs because of it and stuff like that. They, and, and then to couple that with political correctness. Now, I believe political correction, correctness 
should be classified as some kind of dark satanic magic. Because no decent person imposes political correctness on a decent, another person in order to question their humanity. It's just not normal behavior. It just it, you, You're saying you're being a fascist and a bully when you do it. It's just wrong. Now, I could understand if you had someone made a racist joke that was done in a vicious or an insincere or a socially awkward way, you could say, oh, will you fucking stop that? That's just wrong. Jesus Christ, control yourself. But that's the different thing than someone trying to destroy that human being because of it. You see, the real reason I hate this, this, this political correctness, you know, these crazies who, who see misogynists and rapists and racists and, you know, everything bad everywhere but they don't you know for the slightest reason is that they actually water it down so much that the real criminals the real criminals steve just said he googled thomas sheridan on the bbc and the 666 killer story came up Uh uh-huh i'm still getting them back i'm I'm still up you see i won't be on newsnight uh you know boosting their ratings I'm, I've, I've, I'll always be a pain in, in the ass for the BBC, no matter what. And I still am. You see, that's like nature has brought me that way. So anyway, I'm being a pain in the ass for the BBC for the next few minutes. So anyway, I was thinking about BBC presenters who's, who were close enough to Savile but sh- well, and would have known, but hit him. And one that comes screaming into view is an individual called Esther Ranson. Now, Esther Ranson used to host a show in the 70s, frankly, a stupid show called That's Life. I remember watching it as a kid, into the 80s. And it was kind of like, it was just this weird mixture of comedy, kind of burlesque, and consumer replay, consumer, especially other shows, but, um, you know, this is the only one I remember. And, consumer reports it was a very odd show and they would sing songs like i went down to tesco and the meat was off i complained to the manager he told me to fuck up you know that kind of thing we wouldn't say that but it was like that kind of thing coupled with this guy who sat in a chair called cyril fletcher who would read kind of like small ads or funny things from the newspaper and then it was just it was just a stupid show and and i always found her very patronizing and obnoxious now 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 i remember she was on and off various shows over the years. But one of the things I remember very early age was seeing her on this top BBC Saturday night show called Parkinson, which was a, uh, a, a you know, an interview show uh, where, you know, it's still going. I know he's still even going. Michael Parkinson, he's a very famous BBC interviewer. He has a nice North of England accent. And uh, he's very good. He's very good at talkative kind of things. I think he's maybe Geordie or Yorkshire. I don't know. He's around the North of England somewhere. Very nice accent. But uh, he uh, he had her, Esther Ranson, and he also had on that show a, a, a comedian from the Manchester part of England. She's from Yorkshire, Steve just told me. From the, oh, he is, uh, Parkinson, from Manchester called Bernard Manning. Now, Bernard Manning was basically known as a racist comedian. He used to tell ethnic jokes, very kind of throwback to the old days. But I can tell you something, he was absolutely, fabulously, brilliantly funny. Even Stephen Fry, when he died, said that Bernard Manning, despite his his politically incorrect jokes, was the best deliverer of one lines ever. And he was. I mean, I'm a huge fan of comedy, and I love stand-up comedy. And I mean, I used to listen, watch Bernard Manning tell racist, like a, 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 Irish jokes. They weren't, I wouldn't say anti-Irish jokes, but Paddy jokes. And I used to be falling around laughing at them. I mean, they were just so funny. And he, I remember like one time I saw a video, there's a video on YouTube, and he says, uh, I know in America, he's, he's in Las Vegas, he says, I know in America you, you take the, the, the piss out of the, the Polacks. And uh, in, he says, in England it's the Irish. And he goes, uh, but it's not true. He says, obviously, it's, and that's true because I never felt that he, he meant it. There was, you see, it's like that American comedian Reginald D. Hunter says, "Was there hatred in your heart when you said it? Don't worry about it." And I, and I always found that Bernard Manning was the was the epitome of that. Now, unfortunately, his club, I forget what it was called, the world famous something club in Manchester. I've actually been in it. 
uh, not to see a show, but I had a beer. And his picture is still outside, and I passed the last time I was in Manchester. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, unfortunately, in his audience would attract the odd sort of BNP and National Front types, the hardcore right wing. But that would that would be a small element of the audience. Most of the audience would be just working class people looking for a good night out. He also like gave like uh, his club also started up people like the Beatles. That was one of the first regular gigs they had outside Liverpool and things like that. But he. He was very, very big in the 70s in the Embassy Club. Thank you, Steve. That was now the Embassy Club. He was a big star in the 70s and right into the 80s. I mean, a huge star. And I always liked him and never had a problem with him. Uh, I mean, yeah, okay, the, the ethnic jokes, the racist jokes, they weren't, when I say racist, they weren't hate racist. They, they didn't encourage race. They just played on stereotypes and things. But you, they weren't, he, he, but he told jokes about other things as well. The thing was, what I liked about Bernard Mann is he didn't give a fuck. And I respected that about him. When he stood on that stage, he wasn't playing to what the audience expected him to be a good man. And his attitude was, I'm a good man outside my life. I look after my family. I look after my friends. I treat my people with respect. Uh, my neighbors are all different races. When I get on the stage, I do an act. And that's I don't have to prove my humanity. And anyway, Esther Ranson on the Parkinson show was ripping Adam, calling him you know, someone who you know, who uh, you know, he hates uh, Jew, he hates all Jews, he hates all Irish, he hates all blacks. And uh, Bernard Manning, I thought, answered it brilliantly. He says, I don't hate Jews, blacks, and Irish. He goes, I hate people who are Jewish, black, and Irish, but not because of their race. He says, That's because they're, 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 they're bastards, no matter what, no matter what skin color, what religion, and what race they are. I always thought that was a very a brilliant comeback to her. But she went on a crusade that lasted literally decades against Bernard Manning, right? Now, let, when the Savile thing come into this, she was the head of a charity called, I think it was called Childline, that Savile was very deeply involved in. She was also a major BBC employee. If she didn't know what Savile was up to, she, 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 she's stupid because she was so close to him. Well, so she'd be the only one in the BBC who didn't know what he was up to while running a children's charity, right? And calling Bernard Manning an evil man every five years. Now, when Bernard Manning died, she just made this comment about, oh, you know, I, it wasn't rude, but it was almost like, uh, well, he has to live with all this, this, these racist things he caused. But when Jimmy Savile died, she was one of the first people, and this is before this, the sex scandals came out and the pedo scandals came out. She was one of the first people on a, on Channel 4, not that's another network, to eulogize Jimmy Savile as this great man, this great, you know, altruistic charity man, this great guy uh, to do this. Now, it's come out since, and... I've often I've seen interviews with her where it's blatantly obvious that she knew what was going on, and as soon as she her chips were no longer on the table and she was uh, easy to catch out in her lies, started turning on Jimmy Savile. Okay. Now there's a lesson for you. Okay, she spent most a huge section of her career attacking Bernard Manning as the most evil man on television because he told racist or dirty uh, or ethnic jokes. And uh, that was it. That was enough for her, right? At the same time, turning a blind eye to this demon, this demon, this monstrosity, this non-human creature, Jimmy Savile. And it was all tolerated under the guise of political correctness. You know what I'm saying? It was because... If she had political correctness on her side, she was always going to win. Now, Bernard Manning quite rightly said, go fuck yourself. I don't care. I'm still doing my act. And God bless him, he did it to the day he died. He never changed. And I don't care what his subject matter was. That is a man who stood by his who stu- stood by what he believed in, by his, you know, by his jokes. He never changed his act. Now he got off lucky because he was a hard ass. He could tell them to go fuck themselves, and he had a really good, a thriving club and a, a thriving fan base. On the other hand, when the BBC and the ITV and Channel Four in England started to flood started to flood the networks with these political correct comedians, just Ben Elton, not funny, and many others. Uh, I 
you know, Lenny Henry, no talent. By the way, RTE found a clip of Lenny Henry telling an anti-Irish joke and then cut it over to him talking about how evil, evil racist jokes were. So that's a kind of fake he is, that no talent. But uh, it just goes, what they did, they flooded it in. Benny Hill was the, the biggest star on ITV, the biggest money maker, the biggest, uh, because he had like silly kind of smutty throwback, sort of what they call like, I think it's called Rip Crumpet, you know, sort of that very poor kind of version of English comedy, the Barbara Windsor carry on stuff. And it was, it might have been dated by the time. But all, yeah, that's right. Alternative comedy is not funny. That's what it means. He, 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 he was destroyed. Benny Hill died in no time, in no time after he'd, he'd been stabbed in the back by ITV because of people like Esther Ranson and all these other politically correct comedians saying that their time was over. Now, he did, he was a casualty. He didn't make it. Now, but Esther Ranson, now one of the things he does, Esther Ranson, you, you, you should be ashamed of yourself because I tell you something, you represent everything that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take down in my work. You stood there pontificating about how evil Bernard Manning was and you turned you turned a blind eye for decades to the goings on of Jimmy Savile beside you. You are a disgrace. Bernard Manning isn't a disgrace. You are a disgrace. And we're going to the first song and you know what? The BBC, you can go fuck yourself too. And that was Stereotype by Mark Stewart. That's a really nice track. I mistakenly called it Stronger because I scribbled it down wrong. It's actually called Stereotype. And Mark Stewart is like, all the acts on the show are independent, unsigned, small label, own label bands. And these are the perfect antidote to the X Factor world we live in, which I'll be talking about in a minute. I have a caller on the phone now. Let's hope it's not Esther Ransom. But yeah, that's a, a just Esther Ransom was also, as Steve sent me a link there to a story, very quick to help people in her child line uh, charity, which she founded, throw accusations around that other people, you know, nobodies, which she never, ever once ever spoke to people about what was happening with uh, Jimmy Savile. Nasty piece of work. And uh, she's going to have to answer to, if there's an afterlife, I think she's going to have to answer to that one because uh, she had to have known. And she now claims, well, I heard gossip and rumors. Well, they weren't gossip and rumors because if you look on, if you go onto uh, YouTube and you go into Jimmy Savile, have I got news for you? He actually cracks a joke about how teenage girls live in fear of him. And the rest of the panel on this game show, they all like get freaked out and they all like, oh, and they're all deeply uncomfortable because they obviously knew what he was about. I think I think we have the caller back, do we, Steve? Yes, the caller back. back. Yeah, the caller's back. Could you please tell the caller? In? Let's yeah. hope it's not Esther Ransom. I'm on the uh, line. Can you hear me, Thomas? Yeah, yeah. I can, indeed. How you doing? Doing great. This is Chris. I'm calling you from Oregon. Hey, Chris, in Oregon, on the the beautiful part of the world, that. Sure is. Uh, you know, this whole thing with uh, the cover-up of, of how these pedophile rings have been around for so long and um, how people just turn the other cheek or afraid to to get to what the root is, that, that is just something that uh, has been killing me for, for a couple of years now, well, actually for quite a long time. And, um, and and how it's not more exposed and how it's not talked about in the mainstream media. And one of the yeah, things I that I, I came yeah. one of the things that I came across earlier this year that I had no idea that was happening or that was legal in my country, a particular ritual that I think might be at the root of uh, what what allows these type of things to happen is that when it's legal in a in a, in a country for a, a man not just to circumcise a baby, but as in the orthodox, ultra-orthodox uh, religion, they actually put their mouth on the penis of the baby and suck the blood out of it. Yeah, that's true. And, that's, uh, that's, that's an actual sect. It's not all G- orthodox Judaism. No, no, no. Just no one you're, sect you're, you're right. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. I, mean, I don't want to... But wanna, it's, you know, it's absolutely bizarre and disgusting. I agree. And, and, and I think if we don't actually particular ritual specifically illegal in the countries where we live, in this type of pedophile rings and stuff like that, we have no more authority to uh, to um, to really see.
see that they kind of come to an end finally. Yeah, I can't agree more. And I tell you what even makes it more. Well, first of all, circumcision is completely barbaric. It's a Bronze yeah. Age ritual, and it does not, it should not be done, even even if it's allowed by religion. And the, the reasons for it are bogus that it causes cleanliness. It's better for cleanliness. It's all, that's, bullshit, that's all yeah. garbage. You can, you, yeah, this, this, we all, we, soap, and, soap and water has been around forever. It's never been a problem with men that have four skins. It's also a cash really cow, good. particularly in the United States and Canada, for doctors and insurance companies because they, for snipping the baby boys, they can throw on an extra few quid to the insurance company. A lot of that goes on, too. Now, that's, you're absolutely right. I believe that you cannot have laws protecting children if you have circumcision. It's as simple as that. And you cannot have yeah. people like Oprah on TV screaming about African female circumcision when, you know, males, well, it's, it's, it's dying off in America now, thank God. But there's a point where just about every American boy was once circumcised. And now it's down to like 40%. There's a lot more parents are getting wise to it. They're not listening to the doctors saying, oh, it's for cleanliness and it stops venereal disease and so on. And there's tremendous propaganda goes on with this kind of thing, too. I can remember when I lived in America, I was watching a, a document, a, a sitcom, and American sitcoms, and, and British ones even. Well, more so the British ones, it's the, it's the soap operas. They're filled with uh, political agendas. And I can remember, like, one of them was saying, I'm, I'm, I, want, I, I, I want to get my son circumcised, but is it right? And her friend says, of course it's right. It's the best thing you can do. It's clean. It's safe. It stops the spread of, of diseases, and it's also better for the woman. She has a better sexual experience. That's completely mind control. Yeah. Ta- yeah, yeah, that takes it. You, you cannot take the bulk and the girth off a penis. But that, that skin is there for a reason. It's a disgraceful thing. I would love to actually see all the men who've been circumcised against their will in so-called secular countries actually having a class action lawsuits against the government and the, 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 the hospitals who did it. Because to me, that's a massive human rights violation. Now, back to the, this, this bizarre ritual they have in this particular one sect of Orthodox Judaism. Yes, it's, it's real. The rabbi sucks the blood off the, off the penis after he does the bris. It is a, it, I don't know what that's about. I don't know how that came about, but that's just one of the reasons, one of the reasons I'm totally against religion because, you know, even all you need is some crazy sect to bring down, make it hard for everyone. So, you know, you have to remember the vast majority of Jews in America and in Europe are, are, are not orthodox. They're liberal reformist Jews. Like a, a, a friend of mine who's Jewish said to me that, you know, American Jews, the orthodox ones, the, the liberal ones, they're practically Catholics. They eat bacon and things like that. So you can't, it brings down, it brings down everyone, just like in the Catholic Church. You say, it, it's another example. You said, sorry, Chris, you said your name was, the same thing in the Catholic Church here in Ireland. Catholic priests could rape children at will for decades here, for decades. And like you always said, if it wasn't tackled there, how can you tackle it anywhere else? Now, Yeah, and, the, and there's all this outrage against the Catholic priests, and it goddamn well should be, but you know, there's not a word about the 3,000 babies who have their uh, penises, mouth put, on, mouth put on the penises by, by an old man. You know, yeah, because, you, ritual. because you'll be called you'll be called a bigot and you'll be called a racist and you'll be called all kinds of other things. And we're back to the politically correctness thing again. We've got to stop all that. We've got to learn to get thick skins. And when people, when someone, if you if you point this out and someone says to you you're an anti semite, you say I'm not an anti semite. I'm pointing out something that's wrong. If you point out something evil in the Vatican or in the Catholic Church, and someone says you hate Catholics, you say no, I don't. I'm pointing out injustice. That's exactly right. I'm pointing out just like when people point out what's done to women in Islam, it doesn't mean what well, hate all Muslims or you hate all Islam people in Islam. And there's not you know a, a lot a lot of good stuff in there too. To me, if you have a secular society, it's got to be all or nothing. As simple as that. And that that begins with protecting the most vulnerable members of society from the ravages of religion. And that, in every single case, is the children. So I can't that, agree more. I couldn't agree more. It's really one of the greatest. The greatest uh, conspiracies of all time, it wasn't until, you know, uh, the Internet and the YouTube came out when people were actually able to see for themselves via images that this was actually happening. No one actually could see it because it was such a closed, confined sect that they wouldn't allow any outsiders into the ritual. And now we can see for ourselves, and, you know, this is a great time. Yeah, no, and a a lot of things are like that. People are seeing how how meat is horrifically processed in, in, in factory farms. 
And oh, yeah. we do live in an age of, of information and lots of things, lots of things. And, you know, we live in an age, an age where you can see things a lot more easy now. And, it's a, you know, this is what I always say. Our parents and grandparents, we can't sit there and accuse them of inheriting a world that they left a mess because they didn't know. But we know. Exactly. We know, that and exactly we right, have an Thomas. obligation. And if there's one generation that they can actually say that to, it's going to be us grew up with YouTube and everything else because we did know, and we can't use that excuse. And that's I totally Wonderful. agree with you 100. percent Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Take care now. Bye bye. Enjoy the rest of your day in Oregon. Ah, uh, well, yeah, we'll do. <laughs> all the best, mate. And that's it. You know what Chris said there is is so important. You know, I've seen the video of that ritual. It's absolutely disgusting. It's rooted in nothing, nothing decent, nothing spiritual, nothing real. And uh, it, it doesn't, you know, if they want to, if, if people want to form their own world and do that kind of thing, that that's that's another issue. But the fact that it's so-called secular governments that have laws protecting children turn blind eye to this kind of thing, it's well out of order. If you can criticize circumcision of African children on Oprah, then you've got to start looking at home force. See, unfortunately, I'm not putting down America, but America has this kind of thing, uh, you know, and I've lived there for years. I love America. I love American people. But I've noticed that Americans have this thing where there's a sense of infallibility about their own country, that somehow we're doing, we're, we're not perfect, but we're doing it better than everyone else. And sadly, that's, you know, America's just like any other country. It's full of its flaws and it's full of its mistakes. And it's like I always say, the psychopaths get to the top of power because we in the society have not come to deal with the shadow of our existence. And that includes our society. So, for instance, the reason why people in Britain have Tony Blair and monsters like that in the office is because they haven't come to terms with the shadow of British society. And the shadow of British society is and always has been the class system. The class system is the problem in Britain. It's always been there. And, it, you know, and it's, it's worked on both levels. The psyop at the very top is the rich imposing down on the poor and the middle classes. But on the other end of it, and it never ceases to amaze me when I go over, particularly to England, that there's something shameful about a person making a work and a lot of hard, working hard and doing something or creating something and getting rich from it. There's nothing wrong with work. That's a psyop that's been put into the heads of the British working classes and middle classes that it, to keep the money with the rich. There's nothing wrong with someone who, has, who wants money, needs money, and works hard to get it. And if they get the money, good luck to them. That's, that's, that's the shadow of British society that's, that's projected there. And it has not been dealt with. And that's why people like Tony Blair and the rest of them get a Mandelson all get into power. Likewise, in the United States, the shadow of this belief that America is the land of the free and you know it's only it, America only does good things in the world is the reason why monsters like Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush the Bushes get to the top it's all about everything is about in your own life and everything else is about confronting the shadow because that shadow is cast by a very bright light and that very bright light is the key to your salvation now, talking of very bright lights, uh, somebody sent me an email this week that was very interesting, and I never heard this show because I wasn't, I wasn't, I was living away at that, at, I wasn't living in, in Britain or Ireland during those years, but in 1986, it was a TV show. First of all, let me record that by saying, on YouTube this week, somebody, every week it happens now, it's, there's a video shows up on a wall saying, Simon Cowell insulted this kid see what happened next and the story I always follows the story is Simon Cowell misjudged his unmarried mother see what happened next and be amazed and it's always the same story it's some kid who doesn't have a dad he's a bit ugly there's some kid who some woman like Susan Boyle type she's not that pretty and he, she get, they get a bit of a slagging off by the panel. And then they do their big, there's like a lilting, a big music, a lilting piano. And those two, those, those two weirdos, Ant and Deck, you know, say, you know, they're at the side of the stage. And, uh, you know, suddenly Simon Cowell goes, I was really sorry. You're the reason why this show exists. And people share these videos all over Facebook. 
thinking, oh, isn't it great for the, the little kid? Or isn't it great for the Susan Boyle? Or isn't it great for this person? The reality is these are shameless propaganda tools for Simon Cowell. Now, we seem to think this is all new stuff. But someone sent me a video called about what happened to contestants in a show that had precisely the same format, except there was viewer call-in uh, votes. Back in 1986, in the UK, called New Faces. It was exactly the same format. People who wanted to become famous had their little show. They had their semifinals and their finals and all that kind of thing. And there was a panel of three judges who said, you're amazing, you're good. And just like today, the three judges were people who you wouldn't consider talented. They're just like typical showbiz doofuses that they stick up on a, you know, on a box to judge people. It was exactly the same format as X Factor and American Idol and all those shows. Exactly the same. It was exactly the same. Now, they followed what happened to these people from this new face to show in 25 years since. And it's amazing. None of them made it famous. None of them. They, it, at the biggest, they got to be bit parts in a cabaret. Okay? So none of them made it. None of them made the big time. The, it, some of them were quite talented and some of them were quite funny and some of them were not that talented and had delusions of grandeur so nothing has changed in that respect but they had showed these people and what they had discovered they, they were so obsessed with fame some of them lost everything some of them was, it was a catastrophe for them but what they did discover what they did discover was that fame is meaningless that success is meaningless without a normal life behind it. And what they discovered was that, you know, the, the real success was having a happy family life, having friends to help them out in a bad time, not to be surrounded by showbiz phonies, not to be not to have be in the limelight, but have people who were there for them when things went bad. And that was the real lesson they learned, not the, the fleeting fame of standing on a stage for so long and being idolized and it'd be interesting i think you know back then they were still people were saying things like oh back then we we, we didn't we didn't have the same expectations we we want you know we didn't think we were going to be you know we live in a very nowadays it's much more narcissistic everybody it can anyone who can like string two notes together thinks they're going to be the next you know barbara Tyson. it's just how it is people who can tell a joke think they're going to be the next uh you know Richard, uh, what was his name? Richard Pryor. That's what they think they're going to. It's not, there's so much inflated narcissism now that people think they're going to be the biggest and the best. It'll be interesting to see in 25 years what the ones who are on X Factor now. And I remember X Factor now is completely different. Completely different. It's very, uh, it's very slick. You have much more emotional and psychological control of the contestants and particularly the audience. There's all kinds of uh, scenarios and archetypes that they work upon backstage to plug in there to emotionally alter you and to put greater expectations on the uh, the contestants. Like in the past, on that show, New Faces, you wouldn't have got a background into the contestant. Or, you know, you wouldn't have some kid from living, oh, my dad, you know, my dad left me and that kind of thing. And I'm going to sing because, you know, it's all oh, new, 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 new. And it's like that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, the mother's standing there going, that kid is going to go on to meet, you know. And, uh, you know, and it's like, and then the limping music, and they put tremendous pressure on the families. And they always seem to profile, they're like the most, what we'd call, and I don't mean to denigrate these people, because the, the worst, the most, the most poor person on, on, X Factor is is a giant compared to Simon Cowell and the other two meat puppets on either side of them. But the, the you know they, they always take people that seem to have a lot of problems in their lives or there's poverty and stuff like that. So it's a bit of a freak show too, and so their expectations are made even more bigger. And then you have the dopamine inducing you know lilting piano music and you know so and so you know from uh, from Birmingham. You know, I, I want every, you know, I want everything. I gotta make it. I gotta make this. I have to make this. You know, it, this is all I have left. I gotta be there by my dad. You know, and all this kind of crap. And it's like the the, the pressures are incredible. At the same time, too, people are much more delusional. I do remember this one mucker from Northern Ireland who was on one of these shows, and uh, 
he, he went in there and he, you know, thinking he was going to be the next star and he wasn't good enough and he was told it. And then he's like sobbing on, you know, where's the justice? Where's the justice? I want justice. I want justice. Well, the justice was, the, the justice was delivered to him, but he couldn't handle it. So we, there's an element of, of, of us watching this and going, what a dick. He deserves it. Totally deserves it. And that's what it's all about with these shows. There's like an element of throwing them to the lions. So we're, that was interesting to watch that. I'll put I'll put the link on Facebook and you can share it. But it was something like new editions, new sorry, new faces twenty five years later. And these people for the most part they, you know, none of them became stars, but and some of them had terrible times. But it, in the end they, they, they survived somehow. But there was far less pressure on them in terms of the the control system and how the Lords of Perception completely annihilate and attack our consciousness then as there is now so I, I shudder to think and especially the very young children who are put on X Factor and American Idol I sh- and there's also a lot of people who are psychiatric patients you can just tell they're not well and I saw one of American X Factor and there's a woman on it and this woman should not have been put she's a freak show again we're back to the freak show thing and she should have never been put in front of St- Simon Cowell Randy what's his name and your one your Paul Abdul and uh, the woman was obviously unwell and when she was saying, I don't think you realize how good a singer I am, they were playing uh, like this, 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 this theme music from Psycho, like, <laughs> and zooming in on her eyes. We don't know the psychological damage that's doing to her. You know, so there's, there's, the lack of, there's, there's an element, there's, there's a lack of humanity there as well. You know, for start, okay, it's one thing to say, okay, she's obviously nuts. Or she's obviously got mental problems. She shouldn't have been up there in the first place. But the thing was, the producers put her up there in front of Simon Cowell, Randy, what's his name, and Paula Abdul, in order to, Randy Jackson, I think his name is, in order to create that moment of television where everyone around the world can laugh her and go, ah, what a fucking nut. That's what that's all about. So we didn't have that back when I was watching, back in the old talent shows, that on TV, that didn't exist. You were just went up there, you were either good, mediocre, or you were crap, and you were judged on what you were on stage. But there's a whole element since the Big Brother thing came in, and this kind of like, you know, well, back to Nigella thing again with the cocaine, where every aspect of your life is blasted in front of, as, in front of the world as a sort of a addendum to your singing or your dancing or your joke telling or whatever you're going to do on stage. The two things are now coupled together. The personality, the person and the star, and it's all part of this whole celebrity obsession thing that we have to somehow care about the star, or we have to care about them. You know, when I went to see bands, like when I went to see Susie and the Banshees and bands like that back in the day, I didn't give a shit about what their, their home life was like. I was into the records, I was into hearing the music, and I was into hearing the bands. That's all changed now. We have to know everything about them now. Everything. And this is why you lot who are listening to this who fell for Russell Brand fell for Russell Brand because you think you know him you think you know him and you don't know him and when he stands there with his anonymous mask in Trafalgar Square and all this other stuff you don't know him when he goes on he doesn't know him because you're saying he must really really care he could just as easily be following a script that his manager and agents or the Fabian Society gave him as he is being sincere. Now you have to remember Russell Brand was a crap actor Anywhere, I've seen some of, clips of some of his films, films it was a disgrace that he was even allowed in a film. However he has another use and they find another use to because once you get up there it's very hard to fall down because they've been, these, these handlers and these, these agents have invested a lot on you and you're a paycheck and if they have to make you into an activist which so many stars who, you know that every, so many stars who are on the way down become activists to keep you on screen to keep you in you know keep you in the public eye they, they they have to do it they have to do it like when any band or singer or actor that you were into when they first started out when they're really good and they're really vital you never heard them going on about politics you never heard them going on about causes you never heard them do anything like that you just said to them, oh they're good that's the end of it but now we have to couple the personality to the performance. And I don't want that. 
I, I just want the performance, and you just you should just ask for the performance too. You don't have to care about these people. And yes, they, the, the Daily Mirror, which is ironic because that's a Fabian rag as well. So this is part of the kind of like the good cop, bad cop thing with Russell Brand. The, the Daily Mirror published a start a story yesterday, and it was about they they started slagging off Russell Brand and saying he's a big hypocrite and all this stuff, and. Uh, a lot of it, to be fair, was stuff he did in the past. I mean, if the guy's changed, he's changed. But they talk, the, the thing they did to bring up was that he went to that million mask march and he took the mask off and then he deliberately found photographers to take photographs of. And he texted photographers saying, I'm standing here with, on the mask to get as much publicity for himself as possible. And I do believe he did that. I do believe that's the only reason he was there. Now, again, I looked on Facebook and some of the people who still think that he's a wonderful man and he's he's going to save the world and he's going he's going to pay your bills next year. Remember that Russell Brand fans, you remember that because Russell Brand's consciousness revolution and socialist egalitarian pontifications, you don't have to worry about paying your bills anymore. Remember that. Remember that. Your Russ is going to do it for you. He's the next when you go down to the fucking bank next week. Secure in the knowledge that Russell Brand gave it to Jeremy Paxman. And you say to him, I badly need a loan because the roof is falling off my shagging house. You know then that your defense of Russell Brand will be wonderful. For he will come down from a cloud on gossamer wings. Land in front of you and say to the bank manager, I'll underwrite this man's debts. Do you see now what a sucker you've been? Do you see now what a fool you are? Do you see now how pointless it is throwing your emotions around behind all these actors? Because at the end of the day, when the chips are down and when you need real help or you are in a dire straits, you're sharing links of Russell Brand. You know what? It doesn't mean dick. <laughs>